So let's go to Google Drive. I told you we were going to look at the Congress of Vienna, and that's like a, a tour de force of conservative philosophy, if you will. What? Um, yesterday we, we went over this craziness. Probably should have videotaped that. That would have been smart, but whatever. You were here. Um, so go to no, uh, no. Yeah, go to notes. And then go to isms notes. No, go to politics, 1814 to 48. And in there, there's a section that says AP chapter 21 notes, COV. And the COV, of course, stands for Congress of Vienna. That's right. All right. I also told you that a really good supplement for this would be because all of the specifics of this are going to come from that Vialt chapter on the Congress of Vienna. So if you haven't read that, it would be a good thing because if there's like multiple choice or something related to that, that would be a good place to get it. Um, so we're going to look at this um, and then I just want you to kind of get like what the, the couple really important things that come out of the Congress of Vienna. Um, I call it building a bridge to the 17th century because there used to be this political thing back in the Bill Clinton days, you know, and remember he was running in the 90s. So he'd be like building a bridge to the 20th century, that kind of thing. So or the 21st century. So these guys are going backward. And I tried to explain yesterday, that's the conservatives. What do we call it? Mega. Make Europe great again. So the again part means that at one time Europe was great, and in their minds, that was the time when you had dynastic monarchies that ran all of the states, uh, and you had aristocrats, and you had landowning, you know, landowners, and you had aristocratic privilege and customs and all of those things, and peasants knew their place, and everybody was religious, and it was wonderful. So they wanted to get back to that. That's their leave it to beaver moment, all right? Um, and so they got together, and remember, they, they've got some ideas because this, isn't, this wasn't like a great 25 years. You know, I mean, Napoleonic armies like taking over the majority of Europe, that, that kind of, you know, it's, I don't know, sets them off a little bit. They're like, that's not necessarily good to be at war for 25 years. So they're coming together, Napoleon's finally defeated, and they got a lot to sort out. Because Napoleon, you know, when he had taken over territories, he reorganized a lot of stuff so that he could claim him for himself. And so literally, it was only, they had to kind of go back to old maps and kind of say, well, what did the world look like before Napoleon's armies came in and Napoleon disrupted everything? We got to get back to that world. And not only that, but we got to get back to a world that kind of satisfies everybody. Like if, if we say this territory is going to belong to this state or this government is going to rule that territory, is, that, is everybody going to be down with that or not? And we don't know. So the one thing that they did really good, really well, I guess you should say, is that the Congress of Vienna knew something that they must have forgot about 100 years later. Because when you get to Versailles, there was this revenge kind of mentality that had taken over um, the French and the British in particular when they looked at the Germans. And they said, the Germans you lost, and we're taking your army, and we're scrapping your navy, and we're going to take your territories and your colonies, and we're going to force you know, multi-million dollar indemnities on you, and we're blaming you for the war, uh, and if you have dogs, we're probably going to kick them, all right? And we're going to arrest all of your people. That's not good. You know, because if they treated Germany that badly, you know, Hitler's got a narrative. And yeah, I mean, through and, you know, hate the Jews. Um, but he also had, we were wronged, really, really wronged at Versailles. And that didn't happen here. So after the Napoleonic Wars, who it would be regarded as the loser? Who lost? What, what country? <laughs> France. Why? Napoleon comes from France. Napoleon is defeated. You see how the A equals B, B equals C kind of thing? All right. So all of these countries that had been dealing with Napoleon for the last 25 years, they finally got him. And then they exiled him. And then he broke out of exile. And then they got him again. 
And then they really exiled him, you know, and put him like right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. All right. Somebody in first period asks, why didn't they just kill him? It's a fair question, right? Anybody know why? Anybody have any ideas or like an educated guess? Were his relatives still the rulers? No, no, they were going to take those guys out. They didn't execute them, but they did what they called a restored legitimacy, which means all of the all the of Nappy's nepotism was going to be replaced by. They literally said, you know, who was ruling this place before Napoleon put his brother-in-law or his hairdresser's sister or whatever in charge of these states. They went back to like original position on that. But why didn't they just like say, like, Napoleon, you are a brigand, you have created havoc, uh, you are the worst thing ever, and then kind of like carted him in the middle of like some square in the middle of Vienna, and then, I don't know, set it on fire or something. Do they want to make him suffer more? Huh? Do they want to make him suffer more? I don't think he suffered. I mean, he, was a, he was in an Atlantic island. It's pretty cool. He got to be emperor of that island. Respect to it? No. Maybe, maybe there was some respect to it. I don't know. What do you do if you kill Napoleon? You upset the revolution. You, you ultimately have to recognize that at one time Napoleon had a following. Napoleon was regarded as a military hero. The French, probably some, at least some of them, saw Napoleon as being a liberator, as being. A, a great figure. You kill him and do it in a publicly humiliating way, you probably anger some French people that might hold on to that anger and harbor it and want to break that out against somebody. So if, if yeah. they did kill him like, in a public setting, do you think that would have caused like, a civil war? Well, I think it would have caused vi like a very violent uprising in France. And this was a way of kind of just getting him out of sight, out of mind, so that they could get about the business of rebuilding Europe without antagonizing a lot of the French. And as it turned out, they ended up antagonizing a lot of the French anyway. But they certainly weren't going to create a martyr. All right, and that's definitely what Napoleon would have been. You know? Since Joan of Arc, I mean, Napoleon's like the best thing to come along. You know, or Louis, I don't know. All right, so if you've ever been in a fight, and I know most of you have, most of you <laughs> probably recently, all right, but so if you're fighting with somebody that you generally get along with, and you just needed to have that fight, you know, after you like punch them in the face or whatever, and they <laughs> fall to the ground, you you put your hand out and say, "Hey, sorry about that. Come on, you know, let's go get, uh, uh, you know, uh, vanilla mocha." <laughs> but no, I mean, in the old days, that's kind of how it ended up going. You know, we worked it out. But I'm not going to sit there and let you bleed to death. You know, I'll pick you up and carry you along. They didn't do that at Versailles, but they did that at Vienna. So the vanquished victor, if, or uh, loser, if you will, the vanquished, got invited to the table and said, France, yeah, you had Napoleon. We get that that was a bad episode, but we can't do this without you. We recognize that France has a part to play in what they call the Concert of Europe. That was like the phrase that they went with, the concert of Europe, as if everybody has like some instrument that they bring that helps the entire orchestra. So Austria, Prussia, Russia, Britain, the Netherlands, France, they're all there, all right? Um, but even though France was the one that had instigated the reason why they were there in the first place, they said, you know what, France, you're gonna be a, an integral piece of the piece that a piece of the piece <laughs> that, that we're going to create here. All right, and as long as you restore, you know, your legitimate institutions, and legitimate for them meant, you know, monarchy. Uh, they look for a Bourbon, they found one. They look for a Louis, they found one. Louis the Eighteenth would become the new monarch of France after all of was said and done. They went back to a Louis. All right, and they all sat down at the table and said, "We, we got to work our stuff out." So they did. That's what benevolent peace means. This is stuff that's right out of Viol, but it's kind of like five things that sort of came out of Vienna. It said, unless you were liberal, nationalist, or socialist, and I'm going to get to that in just a second, but you don't punish the aggressors, you embrace them as brothers, and ensure that they will not again wage war of aggression against their fellow brothers. All right? So make them part of it. 
You know, I wonder if Germany was treated like an equal partner in trying to create the peace that happens after the armistice. I doubt that Germany uh, is in the place that they are in the 1920s and 30s. I doubt that Europe is in the place that they were in the 1920s and 30s. But at Vienna, they, it seemed like they understood that. Balance of power, everybody knows what that means. The concert system or the Congress system or whatever you want to call it is part of that. It's the idea that there is not one state that is so much more powerful than the other states that it creates some type of awkward or paranoid thing that says, you know, we're, we're worried. That they're constantly in a perpetual state of war. And they thought the best way to deal with that would be to come together. All right? The things that, we, that they knew after World War II, they employed, at least to some degree, after the Napoleonic Wars. It's really pretty cute. <coughs> okay? Like them understanding, you know, that, hey, maybe if we're partnered together and we're cooperating on issues, we won't want to blow each other up. And that's kind of how it went down. Okay? Principle of compensation. And I wrote down almost as if they had, had territorial tape measures. And what that means is, you know, that, remember, at one time, Napoleon controlled all of Italy. Napoleon controlled all of the German states. Napoleon took over Poland and created the Duchy of Warsaw. There was a whole bunch of territories that were just kind of in flux. And you had the Austrias, Prussias, Russias, and of course there's people that are out there saying, you know, we had rights or we have claim over this. And they were like, all right, well, if you get claim over that, what is somebody else getting, you know, in return? You know, where is, where is the balance going to come from? And there were some of those questions. Right? If you look at, um, I'll go a little bit further on this and show you how it plays out. The principle of legitimacy is the real problem. Because what legitimacy means for them, and I said it really ought to be in quotation, is that they wanted a restoration of the world as it existed in the 1760s. Almost like you took like an eraser and said, it never happened. There was no storming of the Bastille. Robespierre is a figment of your imagination. Okay? And it's supposing that Europe can have collective amnesia on nearly 30 years of its history. But that's what they were hoping for. You know? It was like, all right, everything got out of whack, so we're going to go back to a year when we weren't out of whack, and we'll see who was in charge. And that's the big mistake. Okay? Um, let's get back to the next one. The reward penalty. It says you can't get away with at least a little bit of selfishness. There were countries that helped fight Napoleon and they wanted things, whether it was some kind of like, you know, gain that they could make in a trade relationship or it was some kind of naval port or maybe a colony here and there. I think Britain was kind of hanging out hoping that there would be something that they wanted, you know, because Britain had like three things on their mind always. That was their naval supremacy, that was their commercial supremacy, and the third was their colonial power. And if they could augment, protect, whatever, those three things, uh, they usually hung around. And I think that was why they were involved in the Napoleonic Wars in the first place, is because Napoleon started messing around in the Eastern Mediterranean, and the British are like, wait a second, that's our lake. <laughs> all right. But if Napoleon had contained all of his actions against Austria and they were landlocked in tensions, I don't think you would have even sniffed Britain. I think they would have been just happy, you know, to be not involved in it. Right. But they're at the peace table and they're listening. They want to hear what's going on. So here are the people, at least the big players. The five big players are Britain, France, which I mentioned to you, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia were really the, the big alliance that ultimately defeated Napoleon. Okay. And I wrote down the individual representative, like the biggest player at each of the, uh, that represented each of the countries. For Britain, it was a Tory minister by the name of Viscount Castlereagh. 
for France, it was one of the great historical figures that somehow managed to survive through the French Revolution, the radical phase of the French Revolution, the Thermidorian reaction, the Napoleonic era, and then the post-Napoleonic era. They called him Teflon Talleyrand. It's just like, like he was a cockroach during a nuclear war. How the hell did you make it through all of those phases without somebody like guillotining you? But there he is, standing. He's a prince. Okay? There's a prince representing Frederick William III for Prussia. There's a prince representing Emperor Francis I of Austria. Clemens von Metternich. Metternich is like the Woodrow Wilson of the Congress of Vienna. He's like the main player. All right? And you will not find anybody that is more conservative than Metternich. When I described conservatism to you yesterday, Metternich would be like the picture they showed in the dictionary next to 19th century conservatism. And then since Russia couldn't afford to send a prince, a Tsar Alexander I went. I don't know if that's true, but he went. Mm -hmm. right. So, Viscount, Prince, 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 Tsar. What does that say? Who's there? Conservatives. They all have noble titles. They all are part of dynastic power. They all have privileges because they are a de or a von. All right? What? Uh, very much so because the Tory uh, party is running Britain and the Tories are made of uh, primarily landowning aristocrats. That's old noble families in Britain. So I say, why do I insist on prefacing them with titles? The reason why is because you got to know who was there. There isn't some like hammer-wielding working class man from like East Württemberg that's there. Saying, hey, what about the German states? Because all working class people have that accent, right? It's not really fair. Hey, what about the German states? It doesn't sound German at all. <laughs> but there's no lower class. There really isn't a bourgeoisie to speak of here. This is the old school, and they regarded themselves as the victors, and they wanted to reorient Europe back to when the old school was running things. Mega. Leave it to Beaver circa 1760. All right. Okay, so the what happened part is, like I said, all the old monarchs are restored. If they were there in the 1760s, they're there again. And that even means in the German states, even though Napoleon dissolved the Holy Roman Empire and created a German confederation of states called the Confederation of the Rhine, they went back to whoever ran Bavaria, Saxony, whatever it was. They went to the Italian states, all right? And even though Napoleon controlled all of Italy, they went back and they looked and said, Milan, Sardinia, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, who ran those countries? Yeah. Is uh, leave it to beaver like a code word for like conservative? Leave it to beaver is what, when they when the MAGA people talk, yeah. they actually mean 1957. They actually like said the year 1957, and it just so happens that that's when leave it to beaver, the, the show, all right, was released. And it was this idealized version of what the American family looked like with the wife that like stayed home and like cooked and cleaned and these two clean cut white kids and then the dad you know that would come home and he would sit in the chair and he would read his newspaper <coughs> and every episode was just like the most gumdrop stuff that you could ever imagine I was actually I was talking to Mr. Levin about the, the beat generation of American poets like Jack Kerouac, Alex Ginsberg and all that yeah. and I was like so like what was their goal and Mr. Levin was like they were just trying to rage against the leave it to beaverisms of the 1950s. That's exactly what it was. Okay. But it was all nice and neat and everything had its place, but you know, it ignores the fact that, you know, there were racial divisions and a whole bunch of other things and just assume that this was like what you know, a lot of people called as they whitewash history to imagine like that this was the ideal place. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody's families looked like this, and there was no divorce, and you know there wasn't any alcoholism or any any bad stories. You know, all the kids listened to their parents. You know, and the mom was submissive to the dad, just like she's supposed to be, 
right? Yeah. All right. So, anyway, back to the story. So there were some territorial swaps, but if you read about them, it's like watching a bunch of general managers making trades, you know? Like, if you're going to get my second round wide receiver pick, then I'm going to expect a wide receiver out of your reserve core, and then I'm probably going to want a future third round pick. And they were just doing it with territory. So if Russia was making gains on Finland, then Sweden was going to get gains on Norway, and then there was going to be some other, like, trickle down where Prussia would get two-fifths of Saxony and Swedish Pomerania and some part of Rhineland. And the interesting thing, when I was reading about the Rhineland thing, the Rhine it's a great like irony, because right after the Napoleonic Wars, the German states were fearful of French aggression, okay? And wanted to, to occupy a portion of the Rhineland as a buffer state to protect them against future French aggression. Does anybody know what France wanted to do at Versailles? They wanted the independence of the Rhineland as a buffer state against future German aggression. Okay? So the Rhineland is like the, the wall that stands between French aggression and German uh, aggression. And <laughs> they just kind of swapped. Right? Um, this is neat. The Netherlands gets the Austrian Netherlands. How many times has the southern portion of the Netherlands been in somebody else's hand? And for how long? You guys remember the 710 split? Yeah. We talked about that. The 17 provinces in the Netherlands when they were revolting against Philip II, and the seven ones in the top just declared their independence and became the Netherlands. And then the 10 in the bottom stayed allied with Spain and became known as? the Spanish Netherlands. And then after the Louis Wars in 1713 at Utrecht, they got turned over to who? Austria. So then they were called the Austrian Netherlands. And then after the Napoleonic War here at Vienna, they are now called the Netherlands Netherlands. So now all 17 provinces of what was at one time the space known as the Netherlands is under the Netherlands control. How long is that going to last? Ten years. Ten years. About ten years. All right. Maybe twelve. All right. What eventually is it going to become? Um. Waffles. Uh, Belgium. 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 There you go. Good. All right. Austria gets a bunch of Italian city states. They got Venice, they got Lombardy, and their relatives gained control of southern Italian provinces. I wrote in very sarcastic terms here. The Italians are really, really happy to be part of the Austrian Empire again. Metternich ensures that Austria will be a dominant player, not just in German affairs, but also as a statesman of Europe. Okay, and this is where it gets weird. Okay, so they've worked out some of their geographic swaps. But now it's about how do we keep the lasting peace, and that's where they start organizing these things called the alliances. Now one of them is called the Quadruple Alliance that brought Austria, Prussia, Russia, and France together. At one time it was Austria, Prussia, Russia, and Great Britain. Then they invited France and it was going to be a quintuple alliance. And then when Great Britain found out what they had been planning for continental Europe, Great Britain said, see you later. And then eventually it went back to being a quadruple alliance. Then you'll read about this thing called the Holy Alliance, and that one's a lot of fun. All right? Because the leader of this, the proposal, was from Tsar Alexander I of Russia. And the three states that it was going to put together were Russia, Austria, and Prussia. And my guess is that if you went into the genealogy, you would probably find out that all of the families were already married to each other anyway. So it's a bunch of cousins kind of getting together. All right? They all have the same thing in common. All right? Prussia, Russia, Austria. What are they how are their political systems set up? Monarchs. What kind of governments do they have? Monarchs. Absolute monarchs. Do they have big landowning aristocrats? Check. Do they still have kind of a, a religious flavor to them all? Check. All right. So you get it? Mega. 
these guys are getting together and they're literally putting their hands in like a big huddle and saying, you know, like wonder twin powers activate form of reactionary conservative order. Uh, and then they do. And they say this, and I love this because it's just so vague and so often repeated, that they pledge to observe Christian principles in international affairs. And you're like, define Christian principles. You mean love thy fellow man? No, no, no. What we mean is that we will stomp out liberalism and nationalism wherever it might appear. Meaning anything that was the ideas that surrounded the French Revolution. Remember the French Revolution slogan was liberty, fraternity, equality. Okay? Those abstract, weird, enlightenment ideals that, that sort of shepherded all this violence and all of this confusion that if somebody else decides to start espousing those ideals of liberty or fraternity or equality, then we're going to show up and we're going to squash it before it ever blows up into another Robespierre or another Napoleon. Does everybody understand? So they're like, they're like a patrol now, you know? Like some of the dudes in Arizona that like run around on horseback trying to catch immigrants. This time they're trying to catch people that are nationalists or liberals who are saying, uh, we want a constitutional government that respects our rights. And they're like, no, that's evil. All right, so let's look at an assessment here. There is good that comes out of the Congress of Vienna, Ramsha. Do you have a question? Yeah, why didn't they keep calling it the Holy Alliance when they the, they're different things. The Holy Alliance basically just stayed as um, France, Austria, and Prussia. And then eventually they added France. Because Britain's like, wait a second. So anytime there is any uprising anywhere in continental Europe that has to do with, I don't know, like the pursuit of national independence or unification or whatever, you believe that we militarily need to be tied? Because an alliance means that I act if the rest of us act. Right, that's what an alliance is. Like a friendly agreement could be about anything, but once you say an alliance, that means whatever my partners do, I do. And I'm tied kind of by per the alliance to do those things. And Britain's like, no. No, I'm, we're not going to have our military involved every time you guys find it um, fashionable to want to attack some random state in the middle of Europe. So they said, you know, see you, we're leaving. Uh, we're going to see if we can sinisterly take over the Western Hemisphere with the United States. And so that's what they did. Okay, so Britain is not really going to involve itself in European affairs again until 1914. Or technically like 1904. All right, but that's almost 100 years. But France is going to step up because France now has a legitimate government having a king again and has conservatives basically running their government. All right. So the good, back to what, what I was talking about before the question, is that for a hundred years they more or less kept Europe out of major wars. That's a pretty good track record. That's pretty awesome. There really isn't a major European war from the time of Napoleon until World War I. And if you looked at how disastrous World War I was, you, you probably should have said, hey, you guys need to fight it out a little bit. You're not fighting enough. Because when they finally did fight, it was like, you know, it was freaking World War I. Right. Um, they used diplomacy to solve their problems. It's like they, they're statesmen. They sat down at a negotiating table and said, um, our first instinct ought not to be to blow each other up. Our first instinct ought to be to talk it out. And they did that. You know, and that was a good thing. And then these alliance systems, I mean, if you really look at it, this is like NATO. In its own time and place, it's kind of like that. They said the best way to keep a balance of power is if we're all like kind of tied together in a common cause. If we're cooperating on stuff, then we're not competing in stuff. So that's good. What's the most glaring problem with this group? Isabella, what do you think? What's the, what's the 
most obvious glaring problem here. It is the bad and it's the ugly. Historical continuity, right? Look, you defeated Napoleon. Napoleon is a person. The Napoleonic Wars were acts. You can defeat an act. You can defeat a person. What you can never defeat are the ideas that had propelled the act or had influenced the person. The French Revolution was influenced by ideas. Those ideas were things like, we believe individuals should have rights. We believe individuals should have equal access to this or that or the other thing. Nationalism, another ideology, is the belief that I have shared values or customs or languages or ties with other people. Okay? Those are good things. So when somebody starts to assume a national identity and then they look at the landscape and say, that national identity is not realized, bless you. All right? That's an ideology that was brought to them by the French Revolution and Napoleon. It's one of the great, re or one of the reasons why Napoleon is a world historical figure. Is he took an ideology that was contained in France and he introduced it to the rest of the areas that he encountered. So once they're infected with liberalism, once they're infected with the ideas of equality, once they're infected with nationalism, those ideas aren't going to go away. Because the ideas in and of themselves were good. Okay? And for the Holy Alliance or the Congress of Vienna to come along and say, hey, you didn't ever saw this, you know? Like the, the penguins of Madagascar, right? We were never here. You know? And then you just kind of, you can't do it. Okay? Even if your motives were good, if the ideas in and of themselves are good, they will find a time and a place and a circumstance to germinate. You can't sit on it. And the Holy Alliance is basically trying to pretend that those ideas were never out there. Right? Can't go with it. Same thing with the scientific revolution. Doesn't, didn't the Roman Catholic Church and other organized religions, didn't they try to sit on the ideas? They might have been able to persecute Galileo. They might have been able to posthumously, or posthumously like attack Copernicus. They might have been able to kill uh, John Huss. Do you get it? And that's, that's going to be their fight. 1815 to 1848, the conservatives are in power, but they are going to be fighting like hell to keep the ideas of liberalism and nationalism at bay. The best way to describe it is you're in a boat, and there is a hole in the boat. Right? What do you do? You go over and you patch that hole, and then another hole pops up. And you can go over and you can patch that hole. And then three holes pop up. And then you're feverishly trying to get those holes pop out <laughs> before another hole pops up. And then in European history, 1848 is like a thousand holes. <laughs> and then the boat sinks. All right. How long does it take? You'll read at the very end of this Vialt chapter that in Spain and in the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, there are major uprisings. The Spanish, logically, because they don't have a liberal constitution. So the Wonder Twin Powers or the Wonder Trio of the Holy Alliance plus France say, let's get in there and intervene. And they succeed. And the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies is like, we don't want to have Habsburgs running our country. And so the Wonder Twins or Trio or whatever, they put their hands in and say, stop progress! And they go down and they squash the Sicilian uprising. It's like, this time. But what about the next time? Like, how long do you think you can do this? How long is it going to take for German nationalists to not organize and start pushing for German nationalism? There was already a stu student group that was prominent in the late teens. They were called the Birkenschaften. <coughs> and Metternich and all of his buddies started to put all kinds of proclamations together to try to shut them up, deny them freedom of assembly, censor their works. But for how long? You'll read about when we get to the next, like sometime next week, and we actually get to watch how the stuff plays out. 
you're going to get to all these young movements. Okay, young Italy, young Germany, young Ireland. All right, what do they all have to do with? What do all the young movements have in common? They're organizations pushing for national identity, national realization, in the form of unification in some cases, in the form of throwing off, um, you know, like some kind of like colonial power. Like Ireland is a subject, you know, is subject to English rule, but they wanted home rule. The German states were like broken into 38 pieces, but they wanted to be one unified Germany. Hungary was under Austrian control, but wanted their own independence. They wanted to be able to govern themselves. Same with Poland, same with Serbia. All right, just a matter of time. Austrian students are in Vienna protesting the fact that they don't have a liberal constitution. Just a matter of time, okay? Can you imagine trying to whitewash the French Revolution in France? How the hell are you going to do that? I mean, these, these folks what lived through the French Revolution and fought and in some cases had relatives that died for the French Revolution. And then they're going to go back and create the very artificial like you know, political systems that they had fought and died to overthrow and say, well, this is cool. France invented political revolution in Europe. It's like you can't whitewash 30 years of history in the place where that history was made. That's insane. How long is it going to take before France has another revolution? France is the revolution champions. How long will it take? Anybody wager a guess? How long is it going to take between Vienna and the next great French revolution? 15 is the answer. 1830 is the next French Revolution. How long until the next revolution after that? 1848. Okay, that's what they do. They're like, hey, we haven't had a revolution. How many years was it after? Sacre bleu, no revolution. <laughs> you know, they have to have another one. Like, it's been too long. Almost 10 years since the last one. We better do something. All right, so. Tomorrow what we're going to do is we're going to look at two things. One of them is conservatism, which I think we've at least outlined a little bit. But I want to give you like sort of the nuts and bolts and then give you some of the voices for conservatism. And then we're also going to do what we call classical liberalism. Now there's a chapter, and I've given you reading, and it's in Canvas. Uh, but there is, if you go to miscellaneous resources, let me just show you where this is. And it's not the cleanest copy, and I apologize for that. But if you go into readings on the isms in miscellaneous resources, you'll see one that's called Perry. It's the last of the three Perrys. It says Perry, Romanticism, Conservatism, Nationalism, and Liberalism. All right. And the conservatism one is called... Um, Conservatism, colon, the value of tradition. And then right after that is the section on liberalism. It's about six pages, but it'll give you a really good overview about what these movements were. This is what you're reading tonight and what we're going to cover in class tomorrow. All right. The other thing that I will say, once again, is we are up to 35 submissions out of a possible 44 for PSD1, which was due on Monday night. Okay. Remember the new rule. I will keep the posting window open for seven days past the due date, but after that, a non-negotiable cease will be on that due date, and you will get a zero. So please make sure that you guys get that done. That probably didn't need to be recorded. <laughs> Actually, not a bad idea that it was, because if I have to repeat it, I can just say, see video evidence where I said that to you guys. All right. So, Jonah, can you stop time then on that? Sure. All right, good. I don't think I just leave them as they are. I just leave them as they are. There will be a